Okay, thanks. Hey, Daniele, so we'll start uh, this for surprise uh, session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce the three next speakers. And I just want to say one short sentence saying that uh, it was great pleasure to see all your contributions. Uh, that was a great moment. I hope that you enjoyed uh, yesterday's uh, poster session and that will take uh, time also right now to, to hear the three uh, poster winners. So we'll start with Marav Stern. We'll be talking about emergence of slow fast, uh, uh, slow time scales, sorry, in highly chaotic uh, random uh, neural networks. Please, Marav. Um, thank you. So, um, uh, good night, and uh, uh, it's nice to have this uh, conference uh, for, you know, exchange of ideas, uh, even if online. Um, so thank you for organizing this uh, quite unusual uh, thing, and I hope to see you in person. And uh, thank you for the prize because uh, that's always fun. So um, I'll talk about emergence of slow time scales in highly chaotic random neural networks. And this is an ongoing work together with Nico and Luca from the University of Oregon. So why do we even care that autonomous neural networks can generate slow timescales and really diverse timescales, not just slow? Um, that's because this has been observed in the brain. So uh, a study looked at actually multiple other studies and uh, they have analyzed neural time scales across different brain regions. And um, what they did, which is the most natural way, I think, to look at time scales, is to look at the outer correlation functions of these neurons. So here are the two different outer correlations functions of average for multiple neurons in two particular brain regions in the prefrontal cortex are presented. And it's not much about the different amplitude as much as they decay in different rates. So they fitted these outer correlations functions initial decay with exponential fit, and they found that the decaying time constants are very different between the neurons in these two different brain regions. They repeated that for multiple uh, data sets in multiple brain regions, and indeed they showed that uh, different uh, uh, brain regions, cortical areas, uh, have uh, decaying time constant that uh, differ much across multiple time scales. And for us, it's interesting to know to also note that these are intrinsic time scales. In other words, they have looked at data um, before stimulus comes in. So there's no significant input that we can claim that is driving that. This has also been um, observed in the same brain regions. So here's the same idea. It's, these are outer correlations function decaying, but for single neurons. So there are two particular neurons presented here from the orbital frontal uh, cortex. And they again calculated the decaying time constants for this, for this outer correlations functions. And they repeated that for multiple neurons within the same brain region. And they found uh, that the decaying time constants are much are very diverse. And so if you look at the x-axis of this histogram here, it's actually a log scale. So this, not only they're diverse, they're, they're, they're different across multiple um, orders of magnitude. And they have repeated that for additional brain regions. So this is quite a robust phenomenon. And uh, again, they've done it for spontaneous activity, so there's no really particular input that is driving that in any significant way. And because they've done it also for the same brain regions and the neurons are in great proximity, it's most likely that they have very similar biophysical properties. So we cannot attribute this to the, to the neurons properties themselves, not, not, at least it's very unlikely. Uh, so how do we explain this phenomena? How do we explain this very diverse time scales of neurons? Uh, we claim that we can explain it by the network structure and the connectivity. Uh, we, we will show, I will show you that clustering connectivity within the same brain regions of neurons can generate multiple intrinsic time scales. And I'll start by showing you that generating slow time scales using clustering is possible. Usually this 
generating some time scales is the challenging part, uh, right? Because we set the time constant of the network and uh, generating an activity much lower than that is, you know, has to have some, some mechanisms that is driving that and clustering can drive that. So uh, we looked previously in faith models of clusters uh, in which every unit in the network is now a cluster and we model cluster by, um, by, sorry, by having a self uh, uh, connectivity and within this model if we um, write the rate dynamics of this network we know that the, the clustering if we only have clusters and a network is actually not existing then uh, clusters tend to if the if the cluster is strong enough they tend to get fixed in one of two uh, high or low uh, activity so they're by stable these clustering units are bistable. The network in that particular sense serves as a noise. So if there's no clustering and only network, um, the network is chaotic. And the combination is indeed generating this long activity around these two possible high or low firing rate activity and the network um, generates this ongoing activity. This is the rate models. And so if you're having a hard time um, accepting the fact that rate can be you know, clusters can be modeled by this self-connectivity. Um, then uh, this has been shown in, in spiking models as well of integrate and fire uh, models. So um, they also show this kind of bistable very high firing rate and, and after that very low firing rate. And so the models do agree well on that phenomena. And so we'll stick to the rate models in order to be able to analyze this this phenomena better and to also show you how I can generate actually multiple time scales and not just slow time scales. Uh, because if we stick to very strong clustering, we have a problem. The slow time scales, they arise, but they also lead to fixed points. So while the network will have slow time scale, it will be, you know, limited to actually a short time. So uh, we have, uh, search across possible strengths of clustering and possible strengths of, of network connectivity. And if the clustering is strong and you have this emergence of slow time scales, you will eventually get stuck in a fixed point. And so you will want to avoid that. So what can you do? Well, we suggest that you should incorporate also weak clustering in the network. So really multiple clustering strengths in a network can lead to multiple timescales of ongoing activity. And this is a win-win-win scenario because um, you have this very large, strong uh, clustering generated slow activity. You have this very weak clusters that are unstable and generate uh, very um, short and quick timescales of activity. And it's the integration that generate both diverse time scales across the networks, keep it ongoing and generate uh, um, uh, a slow and, and quick time scales together. So um, this has been seen again in spiking models. So if you, uh, write, if you simulate uh, integrate and fire spiking models with different clustering sizes in, of the neurons in that network, you see diverse time scales so some clusters will spend much time in a very high bursting activity and, and then much time in a, in a slow almost no activity and many of them would switch very quickly so they have quick time scales and this is both for the inhibitory cluster and the excitatory clusters and so we can go back to the rate models to again analyze this phenomenon and, and that allows us to use meaningful approach now these are the same rate models as before the Clustering is modeled as the self-connectivity, but now each cluster, each unit can have its own strengths of self-connectivity. So why are the weak clustering let us avoid the fixed points? In order to do that, we have to analyze this equation, assuming that we have a fixed point, right? We want to avoid that. But let's say we run into a fixed point activity. That means that there is no changes in the in the dynamics and there is a solution to this uh, dynamical equation, which is fixed, meaning the network 
here is the mean field, right? This remains a Gaussian input in our network. Um, balance exactly the, the uh, each cluster's um, uh, rate and, and connectivity. And that means that there is a solution to this equation, meaning I solve the left-hand side with the right-hand side input um, for small and weak clusters. This gives me solutions that are close to zero. And um, if you analyze the stability matrix for this equation, uh, you reach a condition for stability. And it turns out that solutions that are small, um, you know, weak activity uh, would simply uh, cause this denominator to, um, to be um, uh, very small. And so the whole thing would um, diverge and there'd be no stability. So weak clustering, small clusters lead to um, unstable and keep them unstable uh, solutions for fixed points. So there are no fixed points, no stable fixed points, and they keep the network chaotic. Recall that I've showed you that strong clusters uh, ha tend to have this bistable activity. So they keep the, their activity around long periods um, and really ongoing long time scales of activity. Um, we go into uh, more depth, but I'll just go super quickly, uh, of analyzing close to clustering. So we, we choose the clustering strengths to be either small or large. Uh, the network is overall random otherwise, and we see that indeed the activity of a strong cluster is relative stable and, and once in a while switching to uh, you know, low or high activity, while a weak clustering is indeed an ongoing activity around some stable uh, firing rate and the average autocorrelation of the small clusters indeed falls very quickly the strong clusters falls slowly. So you do have this uh, very different time scales of activity. And now you can really integrate anything in between and you get all the diverse time scales. Um, we map the chaotic activity. We show that um, the, the ratio can diverge between these two groups. And we also study the sensitivity to input. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that now, I'm only gonna say you know, thank you very much. And uh, I, I think we ran out of time, but uh, maybe there's a questions or something. Thank you, Mirav. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Cloud. Uh, so I was looking on Slack. Uh, I was not seeing any questions. And here on the Q&A, uh, not. Uh, so are there questions out there? Daniele, do you see any that I'm I don't see seeing? any questions, yeah. but uh, if the, yeah, now no one came in on the Q&A. Okay, uh, sorry. So from uh, Reiner Engelken, uh, so how does this compare to slow time scales coming from symmetric networks? And he's giving a reference uh, by some Polinsky and Stein. Right, uh, that's a great question. So, so um, they rise from, correlations and uh, I mean they write this symmetric derives from symmetric connectivity generate correlations and uh, we don't have these correlations in in the network um, and so there are two things one they need to be tuned right symmetric connectivity is, is some some conditions on the connectivity and and two they generate uh, correlations that this uh, solution uh, does not generate. Okay, thank you. Uh, 